The following will be a brief presentation on liver transplants. We're going to talk about the ultrasound evaluation of liver transplants. We'll go over some normal anatomy, some normal uh, findings that we expect to see, and um, a brief overview of some of the complications that we can anticipate when evaluating liver transplants. So let's get going and start talking about liver transplants. What are the indications for a liver transplant? Well, very simply put, it's any patient with end-stage liver disease. So a lot of these patients end up being um, cirrhosis uh, patients with end-stage liver disease, but any causes of liver disease such as uh, hemochromatosis, uh, Wilson's disease, other exotic diseases like that, these patients are also eligible to get liver transplants. The other group of patients who are eligible for liver transplants are those with hepatocellular carcinomas. And they, of course, have to meet certain criteria called the Milan criteria, which we won't go into. If they meet those particular criteria, and those patients can also um, are eligible to get a liver transplant for potential cure. And where do these donors come from? Well, the donors can either be uh, deceased donors or living donors. And uh, there's a, a number of surgeries you can certainly do, uh, and different techniques you can do in order to harvest the liver. You can get the entire liver, you can get a portion of the liver, the left hepatic lobe, the right hepatic lobe. And that's really at the discretion of the physician and really what the patient requires. But you can certainly get them from both deceased and living donors. So let's get going and start talking about the basic anatomy for these um, liver transplants. And uh, for these patients, essentially there are three vascular anastomoses that you need to know about and one non-vascular anastomosis. And so here we have uh, a transplanted liver. And I'll just start to draw in um, some of the anatomy associated with this transplanted liver. So in purple, I'm going to start drawing the uh, donor's uh, portal vein. In red, I'm going to draw the donor's hepatic artery. In blue, I'm going to draw the uh, IVC that comes with the donor. So uh, this is the infrahepatic IVC over here and the suprahepatic IVC over here. These three things, of course, constitute the vascular anastomosis that we're going to talk about. And then the one non-vascular anastomosis is made from the, pa uh, the patient's uh, biliary tree. So I'm going to start drawing the bile duct over here. So there you have it. These are, uh, this is the donor liver. This is the uh, IVC, hepatic artery, portal vein, uh, and the uh, bile duct that comes with the donor liver. And of course, this is all now attached to the recipient. So in orange, I'm going to start to draw the recipient's uh, respective uh, vessels here. So this is going to be uh, the anastomosis that you make, and this is going to be the uh, portal vein of the recipient. Over here, we're going to make an anastomosis, and this is going to be the hepatic artery anastomosis. Down below here, we're going to make an anastomosis to the bile ducts, and this is going to be the biliary anastomosis, so the bile ducts. And finally, we're going to make an anastomosis to the IVC. So you're going to attach a portion of the recipient's IVC up here and a portion of the recipient's IVC down here. Now, in terms of the IVC, uh, this kind of technique is uh, almost an antiquated technique in order to make the anastomosis. Nowadays, what ends up happening, if I'll just redraw it over here, is that if you have a portion of your liver, the donor's IVC is actually tied off at the bottom, the intrahepatic IVC, while the suprahepatic IVC is actually attached directly as an end to side anastomosis to the recipient's IVC over here. So uh, this is the uh, recipient IVC, this is the donor IVC, and this is actually known as the piggyback technique. So this is something that uh, we end up doing um, a lot more now commonly for the IVC anastomosis. And it's associated with decreased complication rates as only one anastomosis needs to be made. And before we finish off on anatomy, it's just important to um, remember that sometimes there may be a mismatch at the anastomosis. So the uh, donor's uh, liver with its respective vessels and bile ducts uh, may be larger or smaller than the recipient's. Um, this is particularly an issue with pediatric patients. And so sometimes you may see a mismatch of the anastomosis, particularly with the uh, biliary tree and the portal vein. And that's an okay finding to have as long as it's not causing any sort of hemodynamic compromise in terms of the portal vein or uh, frank biliary obstruction. So that's just something to be aware of in these patients. Before we get going on what's uh, abnormal, all the complication, I think it's important to review the uh, normal uh, expected waveforms of some of these vessels. So we'll just put the uh, normals uh, in this corner over here. And so for the portal vein, you end up getting a, a monophasic waveform. So it flows towards the liver and it may undulate very gently due to the cardiac cycle and some respiratory variation, but overall it's not very pulsatile 
and uh, it should be patent and flowing nicely towards the liver. The hepatic artery is very pulsatile, so this will be a much more pulsatile uh, vessel, and uh, again, you're going to have flow towards the liver. There's going to be a sharp systolic upstroke and flow throughout diastole. Sharp systolic upstroke and flow throughout diastole. And this results in a peak systolic velocity, so we typically end up seeing anywhere from um, around 200, as well as a resistive index that ranges from uh, 0.5 to about 0.8. So that's kind of expected uh, within the hepatic artery. And we all remember that the resistive index is the peak systolic velocity uh, minus the end diastolic velocity over the peak systolic velocity. The IVC hepatic veins in this location over here, we're gonna see extremely pulsatile waveforms. We actually call these triphasic waveforms. And they really do reflect the uh, right atrial pressure. So we'll have a waveform going above the baseline, predominantly going below the waist baseline, going above again, and then we're back to normal above, below, and then back to normal over here. And these waveforms, as we said, will be known as triphasic waveforms, and they flow primarily away from the liver. So the hepatic artery and portal vein, of course, flow towards the liver, while these will flow away from the liver. So let's get going and start talking about complications. So we'll start talking about complications uh, kind of in this uh, section over here. And again, we can uh, think about complications in uh, two kind of major categories. They can either really be non-vascular complications or they can be related to the vessels, so vascular complications. In terms of the non-vascular complications, you can literally set them up into two major categories. They can either be collections that can occur inside or outside of the liver, or they can be masses. And when we talk about collections, it's really difficult on ultrasound to differentiate these collections. We're talking about things like hematomas, uh, abscesses, potentially bilomas or loculated ascites. And it's very difficult to differentiate them. Uh, sometimes hematomas may have fluid hematocrit levels. Uh, abscesses can have foci of air within them. Uh, typically, ultrasound is used to detect them, evaluate them over a period of time to see if they're getting bigger or smaller, and then used as a modality in order to drain them. Now, in terms of masses, the big thing to know about is this entity of PTLD. So this is uh, something that's seen pretty uniquely in transplant patients. It's a proliferation of the Epstein-Barr virus, and that causes a lymphoproliferative disorder uh, that can manifest essentially like lymphoma within these organs. So it's a single mass in the liver, it's multiple masses, it's a very infiltrative mass, or a mass in the region of the port hepatis, very infiltrative mass over there. So all those are manifestations of PTLD. They need to be biopsied to get the exact stage of PTLD so that they can uh, appropriately uh, treat the condition. Let's finish up with the vascular complications. And the vascular complications can really be split up into three varieties. There are, there are those complications that cause stenosis of the portal vein, hepatic artery, and the IVC hepatic vein confluence, those that cause thrombosis of those same three vessels, and then kind of post-biopsy complications, something like pseudoaneurysm or arteriovenous fistula. So let's talk talking about hepatic artery uh, stenosis. And so hepatic artery stenosis is you have a narrowing of the hepatic artery, and uh, you have some typical waveforms that are seen distal to the narrowing, known as the tardis parvus waveform. And so in the tardis parvus waveform, the um, time to get to the peak systolic velocity is delayed, and the actual peak systolic velocity itself is also delayed. So typically the way you kind of do this is that you interrogate in the liver and you see this tardis parvus waveform uh, somewhere in the liver. Typically you work your way backwards until you get to a region where you have elevated velocities and a lot of aliasing. And so again, we're talking about velocities that are greater than 200 centimeters per second. And that tells you where the area of stenosis is. And sometimes you may not actually see the stenosis. All you see is the tardis parvus waveform and that enough yeah, that is good enough to suggest that there is some degree of stenosis more proximally and that perhaps a CTA or an MRA, some imaging study is necessary in order to determine where that area of stenosis is. We'll move on to hepatic artery thrombosis. So hepatic artery thrombosis, as its name implies, uh, is complete uh, obliteration of the hepatic artery. So there's thrombus throughout the hepatic artery. And this is a devastating complication, one that needs to be recognized very quickly. Um, and both hepatic artery Stenosis and thrombosis are extremely important because as it turns out, the hepatic artery is the sole blood supply to the biliary tree. So if you have hepatic artery issues, the biliary tree will not uh, function as well, will necrose, will dilate, will stenose, will stricture. You're gonna have a lot of issues with the biliary tree and so it's something that needs to be fixed 
uh, fairly quickly. Now, portal vein issues are not seen as common. Certainly, you can get portal vein stenosis, which is very uncommon. And the criteria that's been suggested for portal vein stenosis is a velocity uh, ratio that has increased from 3 to 1. So that suggests that there is some degree of uh, stenosis and an absolute velocity that's greater than 125 centimeters per second within the portal vein. So uh, if you see these, that suggests that there is some portal vein stenosis. Remember, however, that there may be some mismatch at the anastomosis that may give you similar findings. So you really need to uh, take that into account uh, once you evaluate these uh, livers. Uh, we can also get portal vein thrombosis. You want to make sure that you interrogate the portal vein both with uh, color flow and spectral Doppler imaging as very acute thrombus, maybe anechoic, so you, get thro you can get thrombosis of the portal vein, so that's something else you need to look at. And you can also then get hepatic vein stenosis and hepatic vein thrombosis. And for thrombosis, you're going to see a defect within the hepatic veins up here um, as they connect to the IVC. Well, with stenosis, you'll see narrowing with a velocity differential. Not really good established criteria for those, but certainly something where if you see a huge discrepancy, it's something to think about. And finally, we get to the last vascular complications, which are really post-biopsy complications. Uh, you can get pseudoaneurysms, and pseudoaneurysms have, again, a very typical appearance where if you have a vessel that's feeding the pseudoaneurysm, so it kind of looks like this. And so you have flow that's going inside the aneurysm over here and going outside over here. This results in what we call a, a yin-yang appearance. That's typical of pseudoaneurysms. Um, and so that's something that uh, uh, you need to be able to recognize and needs to be treated as it can be life-threatening. And finally, we'll finish with arteriovenous fistulas, which are uh, fistulas typically between the hepatic artery and portal vein. And so uh, if we draw an arteriovenous fistula over here, the hepatic artery that's feeding the fistula is being drawn over here. This is the fistula site itself going to be drawn over here. And this is the portal vein that's draining the fistula. And you end up seeing... Uh, a variety of findings that suggest that there's an arteriovenous fistula. At the uh, fistula site itself, you have very turbulent flow, um, aliasing, soft tissue brewery. Basically, it's very turbulent flow, so the uh, soft tissues around this area are pulsating a little bit more than they would be expected to. At the artery that's feeding the fistula, you get a lower resistance waveform than you're used to seeing in the hepatic artery. So normal hepatic artery resistive index should be between 0.5 and 0.8. In uh, patients with uh, arteriovenous fistulas, that resistive index actually goes down, and we're really talking about resistive indices that are less than 0.5, so really low resistive index waveform. On the portal vein, which it tends to be monophasic, as you can see over here, you start to see more pulsatility in the portal vein because now that portal vein is really getting uh, the vibrations from the um, hepatic artery transmitted through this arteriovenous fistula.